All right. Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started. My name is Jason Sorens. I'm Director of Research and Education at the Center for Ethics and Society at St. Anselm College. And I'd like to welcome all of you who are here in person, as well as our uh, online audience. Uh, this is our first event in a new initiative, potentially, on healthcare policy at the center. Now, the mission of the Center for Ethics uh, is to enrich the knowledge and practice of principled ethical decision-making by addressing important social and organizational issues through collaborative discussion, research, and education. And so we have uh, worked in a, a, an ethics and policy uh, initiative to apply this approach to public policy issues. And we are nonpartisan and non-ideological. We're inherently pluralist here at the center. Um, but what we are interested in is what political philosophers often call the primary goods, things like shelter, nutrition, healthcare, uh, education. We're interested in these issues because we think um, everyone has an interest in them and we want as broad access to these primary goods as possible. There's obviously a lot of political discussion about how you ensure that broad access uh, to primary goods. And our perspective is that uh, when there are barriers that are preventing people from accessing those goods, that's something that I think we all agree is a problem. And so in our Housing We Need initiative, we have looked at um, how we can remove barriers to uh, building more housing, especially affordable housing, uh, that is going to help solve our, our housing shortage in this state. Well, healthcare is another issue where uh, a lot of people are facing uh, high cost and, uh, and lack of access. And so we're looking at whether there are any potential barriers uh, to access to healthcare uh, that especially uh, New Hampshire government can help address. And I'm, and I'm particularly pleased to see uh, many state legislators here today. And I, I thank you for your, your service which is really a service in this state. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a profession. Um, and, uh, and hopefully some of these ideas may prove useful to you. So in our new healthcare ethics and policy initiative, we are particularly interested in uh, the following three problems. First, inadequate supply of healthcare. Second, excessive need for healthcare due to poor health. And third, excess demand for healthcare that is wasted because it does not improve health outcomes. Now, these are big problems, and the literature on them is equally vast. Uh, so to narrow down our contribution to the debate, we're focusing on New Hampshire solutions that can get broad support from across the ideological spectrum. Our center is making use of research, education, dialogue, and collaboration to find ways of contributing to the common good. So we, will hope, we hope that you will join us in discussing our research. And uh, today, we are pleased to release uh, two studies, which you see on your table, and if uh, you haven't managed to get a copy, I can get you a copy. We're also putting these up on our website uh, at anselm.edu slash ethics, um, and these are, are various ideas for improving access to healthcare and improving options for healthcare in New Hampshire. We're not necessarily promoting these as, as a center as the solution <laughs> to, to healthcare. Um, but we, we are inviting a debate and discussion on all these alternatives. All right, with that, I'd like to move to our first speaker, who is author of um, the, the longer study that we are publishing today, uh, Jared Rhodes. And Jared is an instructor at the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. He co-directs the health policy courses in TDI's MPH program and serves as a mentor for the integrative learning experience. Outside of Dartmouth, he is a senior affiliated scholar with the Mercatus Center, a Washington DC based public policy institute where he conducts policy research and provides testimony to state legislators. His ongoing research interests include attitudes and discourse in health policy. Rhodes holds a BS from Worcester Polytechnic Institute, an MS from Bentley University and an MPH from Dartmouth. Welcome, Jared. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason, for uh, 
uh, inviting me to present this work today. And thank you everybody for, uh, for being here today. I'm really excited to be here to, uh, to join you. Um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, so my, my slides, uh, okay, great. So there we go. All right, um, really excited to be here. Um, I wear a few different hats as you, as you heard, one of them is, uh, is teaching uh, health policy and doing graduate uh, research advising uh, up, up at Dartmouth. Um, here's, the, here's the establishing shot at the green. Uh, please come up, visit us. Uh, it's, it's good up there. Um, I love teaching and doing research there. Uh, it's a great group of colleagues and friends. Um, that said, I'll, uh, I'll be talking about, you know, the work today that is, is my own, um, so I'm not speaking for or representing Dartmouth. Uh, so, you know, as they say, the credit or the blame is, is, is all mine. Um, also, no financial conflicts. Okay. Um, keeping with the photos. <laughs> Uh, it was about this time last year that uh, that Max and Jason at the center uh, uh, reached out to me, and and we had a nice discussion. Um, and that discussion, as sort of as you heard from 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 Jason, um, it was in essence, you know, hey, we're talking about um, health policy. We're looking, uh, we're, we're talking with health policy academics in the state. Um, you know, what do you think New Hampshire could be doing uh, or should do to improve healthcare? Very open ended. Um, and I like that the the center was was interested in, in asking new questions and um, and that it, it, they were even interested in just things that could be a spark of an idea and that could lead to further discussion and further debate. Um, and so you know, part of the reason I, I, I say this is to sort of convey the spirit in which uh, I'm here to talk about uh, the, the report that you have in front of you, which is the, the, the direct pathway, sorry, direct pay pathway kind of idea. I won't be claiming that it... Uh, uh, proves something definitively, or or that I've got you know model legislation up my sleeve to send to Concord tomorrow, uh, but uh, rather you know I'm here to share some ideas and to, uh, to to share some findings and maybe like I said help um, uh, you know generate some some discussion. New Hampshire healthcare. Um, New Hampshire healthcare, of course, has strengths and weaknesses. Uh, all states do. Uh, on the strength sides, just to to name a few. New Hampshire is home to many high quality medical facilities, as we know, and talented uh, medical professionals. Uh, in clinical care, we, we were pretty good on a lot of uh, measures such as high rates of preventive screening and um, high rates of immunization, uh, low rates of hospital readmissions, uh, depending on how you look at it. Uh, according to America's Health Rankings, uh, which is put out by the United Health Foundation, clinical care in New Hampshire uh, ranks 11th best in the in the in the nation. Um, our residents seem to be uh, relatively healthy compared to residents of other states. So 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 that's pretty good. Uh, it's not all great though. Uh, on the weaknesses side, uh, health uh, New Hampshire is comparatively thin on certain types of healthcare facility ca capacity. So that's sort of like the supply side. Um, we rank 37th in the nation in terms of available hospital beds. We have uh, barely more than two hospital beds per 1,000 population. Other states have more. Uh, we have about 1.9 ICU beds per 10,000 population, and that puts New Hampshire 45th in terms of ICU capacity. Um, so compared to other states, we, um, uh, we, we we're, we're, we're low on that. And we, we also don't have a lot of ambulatory surgery uh, center capacity either. Uh, continuing on with the weaknesses, um, healthcare is also fairly expensive for New Hampshire residents. Um, although certainly individuals purchasing health insurance on New Hampshire's federally facilitated health insurance marketplace can do so relatively inexpensively. Um, I think we're seventh cheapest in the nation on that. Um, that option is actually only open to about 3% of the state population. So 44,000 people out of about 1.4 million or so. Um, many more Granite Staters, 56% uh, of the people in the state, purchase health insurance through their employers. Um, and those workers pay an average per annual premium of, for individual coverage of over $7,000, which is would, that would be the 11th most uh, expensive in the country. And for family coverage, it's $20,000 uh, per year. Um, like everywhere, I think the way that we pay and uh, pay for healthcare in, in New Hampshire is dominated what, by what I would call conventional approaches. Uh, those conventional approaches are private insurance, public programs such as Medicare, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP. Um, so that's a super quick sketch of the uh, sort of status quo. 
what would an alternative uh, be to the status quo? Well, in the in the report that you have, uh, there's a whole section reviewing various other policies that states have tried, but this is a short talk, so I'll, I'll, I'll be skipping along here and there. Um, the thought experiment that I really want to pose here is, you know, what if we make it easier for individuals and families to act sort of as real agents for themselves, spending their own uh, dollars with, with physicians and um, and healthcare facilities directly, so spending money directly uh, to, to, to them. Um, in other words, the direct pay pathway. Um, it's not something that everybody would have to take partake in, but uh, those who want to could. Um, this alternative, I think, would consist of making greater use of at least two things, and, and certainly more. Um, one would be direct primary care, and second would be direct pay health care facilities. Okay, so for those, this is uh, direct, moving on to kind of explain those two, um, direct primary care. For those who have not heard of it before, the direct primary care it's, is a model for primary care in which physician practices charge uh, patients a fixed periodic fee, usually a monthly fee, uh, for a suite of primary care services. Services include patient exams, uh, routine labs, x-rays, uh, consulting services, sick care, health maintenance, wellness service, chronic disease management, um, minor pr procedures such as stitches, uh, wart removal, rapid stress tests, uh, uh, really a, a electrocardiogram, a lot, uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite an array of, of um, um, uh, procedures can be included in, in this. Um, some practices include immunizations and nutrition services as well. Um, importantly, uh, DPC practices do not bill third parties. Uh, they don't bill insurance companies. They don't bill government programs. And by moving away from uh, fee-for-service insurance building, uh, billing, uh, what they find is that uh, they can leave behind the, the overhead costs associated with third-party billing. And then with that less overhead to pay for, uh, they can sort of redeploy that efficiency in terms of things like longer visits, 24-7 uh, uh, access, and offering that to, the, to their patients, um, and, and other benefits. Um, on the patient side, to, to, to protect against uh, you know, the unusual, unexpected, and, and catastrophic medical needs, um, almost all DPC patients uh, purchase a high deductible uh, wraparound insurance policy uh, if, if you go the route of, of DPC, um, and it's a, you know, it's a perfect complement for that. This is a table of uh, various estimates of uh, that, that monthly fee that I was referring to as reported in the literature. Um, the average direct primary care subscription fee is about $75 per month. Uh, there is a range there, but that, that corresponds to different levels of services, and there, there may be more or less for a, a given practice. How long has uh, direct primary care been around? Um, well, in one sense, it, it, it's sort of the original model of care. Um, but if you're talking about the sort of the term DPC and the more recent uh, uh, reemergence of it, it's been probably about, about in the last 10 years or so. Um, again, this is a table from the report. Um, it shows various estimates of the, the number of DPC practices nationwide over time. Uh, back in 2014, there were an estimated 125 DPC practices nationwide, and today there are about 1,700 uh, practices nationwide. So that's 1,700 practices out of something like 230,000 uh, total medical practices in the U United States, um, a small percentage. Um, and I, th I think this will continue to grow, but I, I think it'll continue to grow relatively slowly unless we can add another piece. And that's kind of what I'm building up to here. Um, but first, uh, what does DPC look like in New Hampshire specifically? For this report, uh, I conducted a, an original survey of direct primary care practices in New Hampshire. Um, as best as I could discern, there are 10 such practices in New Hampshire as of earlier this year, about January timeframe. Um, I surveyed these practices and, and uh, got responses from all 10, maybe the, the first and probably the only time I'll get 100% survey uh, response rate uh, in, in my career. But uh, just to hit on a couple of the, you know, the top level items, um, most, D, most New Hampshire DPC practices 
were started in the last few years, so 2020 or 2021. Uh, but there are a few that have been around longer than that. Um, those, those few practices that were started in, say, 2015, 2016, um, they certainly would have been early adopters. Uh, moving on, uh, most New Hampshire DPC practices have a goal of enrolling about four to 500 patients as monthly subscribers. If, if, you're, if you're wondering how many patients do these um, practices uh, typically uh, see, have. Uh, the median goal for panel size is 450 patients. I also asked uh, practices in New Hampshire, you know, what is your um, you know, how close is your, is your practice to reaching your, your goal panel size? And about half of New Hampshire DPC practices feel like they're at or close to their goal uh, for, for the number of patients that they have. So that would be the top two bars. Um, and then, then about half of the uh, uh, New Hampshire DPC practices are still looking to add patients. Um, so that's the, the, the bottom two, two bars here. What do New Hampshire DPC practices charge as their monthly subscription fee? Um, well, some, uh, but not all, DPC practices have different fees depending on how old you are. So I, I sort of split it out here. Children are the cheapest at about $71 per month on average, then adults at $83 per month, uh, then seniors at uh, $133 per month on average. Um, and there are some big ranges on these, which reflect that uh, some of the practices have, you know, a, again, a more extensive list of, of services that they, they provide. Also, some of the practices offer a family discount, and so kind of you know, disentangling that is, is a little bit messy. Okay, so trying to establish there that, you know, DPC is, is promising. It's small, but it's seemingly successful, at least off to a successful start in, in New Hampshire, and it has been successful elsewhere. Um, but I think to sort of form a, a true alternative, though, you, you also need something else to, to kind of flourish. And, and this is what I'd like to see flourish in, 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 the, in the state, possibly. Um, and that would be direct pay health care facilities. Um, just as, as primary care, you know, the theory behind direct primary care is, is sort of it becomes more affordable and more patient centered when we encourage um, direct payment. So uh, the idea is, well, maybe that too could apply, that principle too could apply to uh, minor surgeries. Maybe those become more uh, affordable and more patient-centered if we can somehow allow or encourage direct payment for, uh, for those services. Currently, uh, most outpatient healthcare facilities, you know, surgical centers, imaging centers, outpatient uh, rehab facilities, and others, they work squarely within the, the, the conventional uh, system of, 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 of insurance. They negotiate prices for different payers, uh, and unless you know, kind of forced to by law or something, they they try to keep those complex schedules, price schedules, confidential. Um, and that leaves patients in a bit of a tough spot. Um, if you're trying to, if you're a patient, you're trying to shop around and obtain some price information on a procedure or service. Um, you're often not given anything uh, that's that's helpful information. Under the status quo, hospitals will, will refer callers to lists of you know, charge masters, sticker prices accompanied by difficult to understand clinical language. Even physicians have a hard time figuring out what a, a procedure uh, or service is actually going to cost. As um, health economist John Goodman uh, is, is fond of saying, and, and I entirely concur, quote, almost no one in healthcare ever sees a real price for anything, end quote. And, um, and I think, you know, we, we sometimes look at this and, and think, well, you know, patients sort of act as if they're not motivated to, to exert the additional time and effort to, to choose a low-cost provider. But I'm not so sure that they're actually uninterested in, in prices. I, I think they're more frustrated and kind of demoralized by, by the whole process. I think a, a question that, uh, you know, someone needs to be asking, maybe it could be us, um, is could direct pay healthcare facilities help us kind of out of this trap? Direct pay healthcare facilities, also called sometimes cash only or cash based uh, facilities, provide, uh, you know, just like DPC uh, on the primary care side, they provide a variety of services, variety of different um, you know, surgical services, for instance. And like DPC practices, they don't accept uh, third party payment of any kind. Also, a core belief of direct, direct pay facilities is upfront, very transparent pricing. Um, there's some evidence that uh, prices are lower if you go this route. Uh, for instance, if you look at the 
publicly posted prices for a handful of common procedures uh, at one of the best known examples of a, of a direct pay healthcare facility, which is the, the surgery center of Oklahoma in Oklahoma. Uh, and, and they compare those to the pri prices pace posted on the New Hampshire health cost website. It you know, looks like this. Uh, tonsillectomy, you know, $3,100 direct pay versus almost $12,000 in, in New Hampshire under the status quo. Knee surgery, $3,740 direct pay versus about $15,000 uh, in New Hampshire status quo. Shoulder surgery, $5,720 uh, direct pay versus $56,000 uh, according to this website and, and, and so on. Um, I would say at minimum, these are kind of interesting differences that we should want to look at more into. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, I kind of have to skip along here, but uh, let, let's grant for a moment uh, uh, that uh, that New Hampshire patients might be better off uh, if we had more direct health, direct pay healthcare facilities here in the Granite State. That brings us to the question, well, is there anything in current state policy that is stopping them from coming here? I mean, why, why don't we see lots of these uh, all around? Um, is there something preventing them from being built? Well, I think uh, pre-2016, the, the place to look might have been uh, New Hampshire's Certificate of Need laws, uh, the, the CON laws, as they're called. Um, but in 2016, the, the CON Review Board was, was abolished and um, replaced by language added by uh, Senate Bill 481. Um, and so this new re regulation is, is what's in place right now. And it places a different set of restrictions on uh, the construction of, of new medical facilities. Under this law, all new, all new healthcare facilities seeking a license to operate uh, must accept all payers. Um, so would that affect a direct pay facility? I think so. That would obviously discourage somebody uh, who is you know, planning to open a place that would only accept cash. Another, uh, another requirement of, of this regulation is uh, that all new inpatient healthcare facilities seeking a license to operate must have a 24 seven emergency department. And again, that would, to me, that would feel limiting if you were a new direct pay facility looking to open, but you were only planning to specialize in something else, some certain type of surgery, let's say. Uh, finally, um, if uh, you know, any new healthcare facility that wishes to open within a 15 mile radius of a critical access hospital uh, must receive clearance from the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services uh, commissioner. Um, and so again, that, that sort of places much of the state uh, off limits for, for newcomers in, in some way. Now there's, there's only so much you can try to figure out, um, you know, analytically about, uh, you know, how many entrepreneurs would have opened up uh, a, a direct pay healthcare facility if it weren't for this regulation. Um, with the all payer requirement and the 24 seven ED requirement, there, there isn't a whole lot you can do to measure the effects um, without, well, without doing a lot of work on that. Um, with a 15 mile protection zone though, uh, for, the, for the critical access hospitals, you know, we can at least, I think, visualize what it, what it looks like. Um, so for this report, I, I generated a map to, to show where um, a new healthcare facility would be free to open up without having to get that special clearance from the New Hampshire Department of uh, Health and Human Services. And, and it looks like this. Um, so the, the, the yellow zones here show a, uh, are, the, are the 15 mile radii around each of the, uh, the 13 critical access hospitals uh, in the state of New Hampshire. As you can see, basically only kind of in the south, maybe the southeastern part of the state, that and maybe up there on the Kangamangas, uh, that was a joke. Uh, you know, could you could you actually open up a um, healthcare facility and not have to go through that extra permissioning process? Um, so again, to me, that seems limiting um, and worthwhile looking more into. I think as part of this research, I I did request and obtain some information from um, the, the DHHS uh, Office of Legal and and Regulatory Services, um, who were very helpful, by the way. Um, but according to that office. Um, since SB 481 became uh, effective in 2016, there have been nine initial applications that have triggered that 15 mile uh, radius rule. Um, in each of those nine cases, uh, quote, it was determined that the establishment of the facility would not have an adverse effect on the critical access hospital uh, implicated, end quote. Um, so it was, so, so that's interesting, um, but 
I mean, it was not within the scope of you know this particular project to to then go ahead and you know obtain the names of those applicants and um, you know follow up and and see well what, did they go through with that process did they did they end up constructing what they what they wanted to and and it's also just not knowable how many health facilities were deterred from applying in the first place um, because of the existence of this res regulation. Okay, kind of wrapping up here, I got a, a slide or two to go. I think, um, oop, here we go. I think the um, direct primary care and direct pay healthcare facilities um, work together in a, in a positively reinforcing way. Um, why? Well, I, I don't think the primary, so direct primary care, I don't think the direct primary care in and of itself is really that big of a leap for people. It's, it's pretty uh, reasonable, pretty affordable. It's pretty, um, it's value pr proposition makes a lot of intuitive sense uh, generally to people. But one thing I think that gives people pause about going the DPC route from primary care is that if you are going to kind of choose to go that route and you're gonna maybe even forego traditional insurance uh, coverage for, for primary care, then you, the next question you might ask is, well, what if something happens though, right? And there are sort of two different levels of what if something happens. There's the kind of mid-level what if something happens, which is, you know, a, a, a maybe a minor knee surgery comes up, gallbladder surgery, a hernia repair. Um, there's that kind of, that, that level. But then there's also the much more serious kind of rare, uh, non-elective, you know, what if something happens? Those are the, you know, the, the serious and very expensive, the, the, the cancer, the, the heart attack, et cetera. If your state has a, a, a vibrant presence of direct pay facilities with low prices, the, the kinds that we saw earlier in the, uh, with, the, with that table a few slides ago, it makes those mid-level procedures uh, far less scary, I think. And the price, you know, so now the price of that mid-level surgery is, you know, 5,000 instead of 50,000, uh, as we saw with the shoulder surgery. Um, and then as for the, the, the legitimately expensive but, but rare procedures, well, um, you're covered there because if you go with direct primary care, then you're almost certainly going to pair that with a high deductible health plan. Almost everyone who subscribes to uh, DPC does do that. Um, and so what we're kind of you know, put, putting out there for, for consideration is, is this idea of, of a, maybe a whole new pathway. And the idea being that these things reinforce each other. So if we're if we're looking at direct primary care and wondering, well, it seems like it's kind of small. Is it ever going to get you know much significantly bigger? Well, there are if, if if we don't have a lot of regulation on direct primary health care that direct, direct primary care that is that is limiting it, there could be these these uh, limitations that occur elsewhere in the system that end up um, uh, limiting direct primary care indirectly. So. There's certainly some some questions for uh, you know the, the direct pathway uh, proponents. We have a Q and A coming up, so maybe I'll just save them for there. But to even just kind of put them out there in, in advance, you know, what does the quality of care look like under DPC? Uh, does what about the whole system capacity thing? Does DPC increase or decrease system capacity? Are current facility licensing rules preventing the opening of new direct pay uh, healthcare facilities? Um, would easing rules on on opening uh, on the opening of new direct pay healthcare facilities have any negative effect on critical access hospitals? Um, you know, and does the combination of DPC plus direct pay facilities plus HDHP, the high deductible health plans, um, does that whole you know that 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 sort of alternative view does that uh, or alternative path could that lead to savings and and in, in care capacity that's better than the status quo? That's kind of the uh, you know some some questions out there that we could we could uh, certainly explore. Some, some more work could could probably be done. Um, I think with that, I will say thank you, and uh, yeah, I'll return for for questions. Yeah, we're going to do some individual questions now, and then we'll also have a general Q&A at the end. So we can take a couple of questions right now. I mean, I can also give you this. Oh, okay. So you can have that. And uh, yeah. See it? <laughs> okay. All right. So your question number four, where you said, what's the effect of this on, what's the effect of um, a, a, a direct care facility on critical access care facilities? 
uh, the assumption in the legislature when we had a bill to authorize a kind of a Kaiser Permanente model here in New Hampshire was that it would be a definite threat and with the very low margins that these critical care facilities are operating under, uh, the legislature chose not to accept the risk of having these facilities that aren't required to serve everyone. Uh, and at the same time, basically killing the critical care facilities. And so we, there, there, that, was, that was the issue there. And we didn't have the data but we certainly had the testimony to, to lead us to that conclusion. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, that, that, you're right. That's that's the that, that's the sort of the theory or the or the the, the concern, right? Um, I I would what I'm kind of getting at is it's it's a I think it's a, an interesting enough and important enough question. We should let's do some let's do some data on that. You know, let let's try to figure that out somehow, as opposed to just theorizing uh, about. About that, I mean, critical access hospitals—they're—they're they're supposed to be reimbursed at 101 percent of reasonable costs. I mean, they—they they have the some protections there. Um, if if a couple of procedures that they commonly do and and make, let's say, you know, a, a, a margin on, go out the door because something else opens up nearby, is is that enough to really threaten them, or is it does it just make them you know slightly less? Uh, Less less viable. I don't know. We don't know how how big. I guess we don't we don't know the magnitude of that. Is which, and I'd love I'd love to know that more accurately, other than just sort of uh, kind of guessing at it. You know. Well, that kind of definitely yeah. data would definitely help. Yeah. I'm just letting you know that the legislative bias was that we're going to kill so many facilities, and, mm -hmm. and we'd have vacuums of care. So. Spend a lot of money on. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned. Um, you know, some things that might stand in the way of the expansion. Um, my thought, let me know if, if I'm wrong, is that a big one would be that a lot of people have health coverage with uh, minimal deductible. And so they'd end up paying, um, you know, for the DPC on top of already paying for insurance. In particular, I'm thinking of, as I'm sure a number of other people in here and I are on Medicare. Um, and then the other one is if you've got an employer plan other than maybe one with a health savings account with a larger deductible, I don't know that it would make economic sense to make use of a DPC physician. So is that really yeah. a problem and what can we do about it? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think this is, this is if this thing, this kind of alternative pathway, this is like kind of in the same sense of like going off grid is not for everybody either, right? Like, you know, if, if you've got a, uh, if, if it makes sense for you um, and it could, it could, and if you get, um, uh, if if you like the, the the DPC model, if you like the the different kind of doctor patient relationship you know, that you're likely to get under that, if you if you really value a, a much longer visit, if if, if the, the the shorter visit is is a non issue for you, um, and yeah, and so it and also if you're already if you're in Medicare, that that's going to require some 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 big changes if uh, to say the least, uh, probably to to make that those kinds of things compatible. But for some, there are some people out there where this path is, would be a very um, uh, attractive path. But yeah, and, and then I think what maybe your first point was was about almost like double paying, right? And and that almost kind of is similar to um, on like the education side, right? When you want to, uh, if, you, if you're con kind of considering uh, homeschooling or something, right? You might, you, you might look at that whole situation and say, well, um, I kind of already, we're sort of already paying for the school. And then like, are we going to you know, uh, decline that thing that we're already paying for, and then uh, to to either you know a, a spouse stays at home or something, and um, and uh, you know foregoes that salary or, or or something. You know, you feel like you're double paying, and and so that's why I think it is a leap for people to um, forego uh, you know traditional insurance and then go this route. I'm saying we might we might be able to get more people to go that route if um, if, uh, if if the the, the downstream is is a little bit clear and, and, and a little bit more well functioning. So uh, it, the 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 higher acuity stuff that I was getting to at the end. Yeah. I would just guess that's probably one of the major things that we need to discuss. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I don't see see this to be like the a, a dominant thing or something that that takes over uh, you know fifty percent of the market or anything. I, 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 but I think there's there's some cohort out there where this would be a really attractive um, you know alternative. 
I'm just going to interject here. In, the, in your study, Jared, don't you say that um, that the majority of DPC patients have some sort of like catastrophic plan that's a, a backup for huge expenses as well as their DPC subscription? Right. Yeah, that's the high deductible health plan. And um, yeah, there's 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 you know it's it's very common and uh, and uh, and a good idea. I would, you know I would say to to have that if you go. Uh, so if you're you know if you're able to 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 forego the the kind of regular let's say um, employer. Uh, in sponsored insurance, um, and you decide to go with D DPC, you want to you want to be covered for the 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 bigger what ifs, and and you can do that with a with a high deductible health health plan. Um, there are some. Um, the other thing that comes into play here is the is health health savings accounts too, and and to what extent can you use those or not? You can't use yeah you and you can't use uh, under like federal uh, or current. IRS rules, you can't use a, a health savings account to pay for your monthly, you know, the, the monthly, you know, $75, uh, let's say, um, DPC card, you can't pay for that, but you can still have a uh, HSA health savings account and, and use it to pay for the, uh, the, the, the procedures and surgeries that might come up. So you can be. Um, thank you. We've had bills in the legislature that have points one and two, the all payers and um, addressing the 24 seven emergency departments um, that we did not address the 15 mile bubble. Mm -hmm. Would a bill that just addresses the all payers and the emergency room requirement be sufficient or would piercing that bubble of the 15 mile radius also be necessary to expand this market? Yeah, uh, focusing on one and two could be possibly sufficient and you know you want to of course think it think it through a little bit but um i i think part of the reason that i i spend a little bit more time on the third one is that that's something that i could analyze in some way and show and and, and kind of getting that visualization i think uh you know you know that 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 map with the with the with the with the zones uh colored in um that's a, a kind of a way of making that real and, and i'm not sure everybody realized uh how how much those things end up overlapping when you go you know 15 miles in every direction um, and there's, uh, with regard to the, that's, so that wasn't to imply that that's like the most important one or anything. I, I think actually maybe the one and two, uh, might be more important. Um, but there's just, you're, you're dealing with almost like a hypothetical counterfactual on that one is, you know, how many, how many people don't even apply because of, uh, to, you know, to, to open up one of these places because of one and two, it's kind of, kind of harder to know and, 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 you know, analyze or show in any way. Yeah. How long do you think it would take to get the data on the impact of critical asset costs? Great question. Don't know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, given interest of time, why don't we hold remaining questions until after all the, the speakers have spoken and, uh, and we'll move on to our second presentation. Let's skip through the uh, appendices here. All right, next we have Alicia Plemons and Ed Timmons. Alicia Plemons is an assistant professor of business in the Department of General Business at West Virginia University, director of the online hybrid Master of Business Administration program, a research fellow of the Knee Center for the Study of Occupational Regulation, resident scholar of data-driven West Virginia, and co-founder and leader of the Scope of Practice and Medical Licensure Research Group. Her research uses applied spatial and econometric methods to determine how policy changes affect labor markets by studying how to create environments that facilitate healthy economic growth and business development through research into the determinants of entry, operation, and exit decisions of firms, laborers, and consumers. Her research has been published in numerous academic journals, such as the British Journal of Industrial Relations, Health Economics, and Annals of Regional Science. Her work on medical licensure and certificate of need laws has been featured in several news outlets. And Edward Timmons is a service associate professor of economics and director of the Knee Center for the Study of Occupational Regulation at the John Chambers School of Business and Economics at West Virginia University. He completed his PhD in economics at Lehigh University. His research has been published in scholarly journals, including the Journal of Law and Economics, the Journal of Regulatory Economics, the Journal of Labor Research, the British Journal of Industrial Relations, Health Policy, Monthly Labor Review, and Nicotine and Tobacco Research. His research has been heavily cited by the popular press, by the Federal Trade Commission, the Obama White House, and also in a Senate hearing entitled License to Compete, Occupational Licensing and the State Action Doctrine. 
He is regularly asked to provide expert testimony in state legislatures across the U.S. on occupational licensing reform and the practice authority of nurse practitioners. He has also authored numerous articles in the popular press. In his spare time, Timmons enjoys spending time with his wife, Nellie, and his two sons, Warren and Francisco, traveling, cooking, and closely following his beloved New Orleans Saints. All right, Alicia and Ed, welcome. Thank you, Jason. It's uh, fantastic to be, be here at St. Anselm. Uh, at the Nice Center, we're really honed in and focused on this topic of occupational licensing. So uh, afterwards, if uh, anyone has any questions, we'd be, Alicia and I would both be happy to answer them. So uh, just to give a, a roadmap of what we're going to talk about this afternoon, uh, the supply shortfall in the healthcare workforce is a real challenge. And it's, it's been a challenge that we had uh, in New Hampshire and, and really throughout the United States before COVID. It got highlighted in COVID and we're, we're still experiencing it. I'm going to talk about the role that occupational licensing plays in contributing to this shortage. Uh, my colleague Alicia is then going to run through some recommendations that we have and uh, we'll then conclude. So these are just two headlines that I pulled. And it isn't that difficult. If you just do a Google search for physician shortage, uh, you're gonna find uh, quite a few articles. Uh, this is a persistent challenge. And I'm an economist. My, my colleague Alicia is an economist as well. Uh, we sometimes sleep, eat, dream uh, supply and demand. Uh, you know, we're, we're thinking supply and demand, I think in our, in our heads all the time. Um, if we just boil it down to a supply and demand issue, Demand for healthcare has been growing, right? We have an aging population. Uh, a lot of the focus on the policy side, I think, has been on the demand side, trying to make sure that folks have coverage. We've had expansion of Medicaid coverage. We'd have the, we've had the Affordable Care Act. Um, on the supply side, not as much attention has been devoted to this side of the market. And unfortunately, the supply side is quite rigid it doesn't really react to market conditions. And one of the main factors here is occupational licensing. So before I get to the effects of licensing, this is just a map that I, I pulled up. And uh, this map isn't all that different from a lot of other states. Uh, you know, Here in New Hampshire, every single county, at least part of it, has a shortage of medical providers. There's just not enough medical providers to go around. So how does licensing contribute to this? Well, first off, let me just backtrack and talk to you a little bit about what licensing is. Uh, I'm sure almost everyone in the room has had some encounter with this, but licensing is a law that makes it illegal for an individual to begin working in a profession before meeting minimum entry requirements. And oftentimes those include minimum levels of education, passing exams, paying fees to the state. Licensing is particularly prevalent in healthcare with more than 40% of the workforce being subject to occupational licensing. Now there's good arguments for licensing. If we think about why we wanna license doctors, right? the idea is we're gonna set a minimum level so that consumers know that every single physician has completed a bachelor's degree, they've gone to medical school, they've completed a residency and so forth. Now there's good debate we can have. Uh, there, there's different models for how we should regulate, how we should license physicians. I'm not gonna go into that today. I'm gonna focus specifically on the issue of practice authority. So licensing is quite prevalent in healthcare one issue that comes up quite a bit for healthcare professions is what non-physicians and non-dentists in healthcare are permitted to do by law. And there are significant differences across states. New Hampshire does very well when it comes to nurse practitioners and certified nurse midwives. As you'll see with our recommendations, we think that there might be some opportunity for New Hampshire to look to some other states on some other professions. Now, it could very well be that physicians and dentists in their role on state medical boards 
are acting in consumers' best interest. After all, they are the best trained medical providers and they know medicine and they know dentistry better than anyone else. But also, when we think about the roles of these professionals, we also have to think about their own self-interest. So physicians and dentists could very well be acting in their own self-interest by trying to stave off competition. They might be thinking about, well, you know, would, would this pharmacist, would this dental hygienist, would this dental therapist potentially take some business away from me? They might see them as a potential threat. So us economists, and particularly Alicia with her work as uh, head of the uh, scope of practice, uh, Huddle, has uh, done quite a bit of work on what the effects of, because you know, with states having all these different policies, we're able to better understand what the effects of these policy changes are. What, what do we know about allowing some of these non-physicians and non-dentists to work to the full extent of their training? Well, there've been two studies that have synergized the literature on practice authority. This is a study by the Brookings Institution. It came out a couple of years ago. And you can see down here at the bottom what the conclusion is by summarizing all of the research that's been done in the economics literature as well as the uh, health policy literature. And essentially, if we let advanced practice registered nurses, APRNs, and physician assistants work to the full extent of their training, that more healthcare can be provided there doesn't seem to be any adverse effects on quality, and it could even potentially reduce costs. So you're essentially unlocking the potential of these providers and beefing up the supply side, right? Not, it's not gonna fix all of our challenges, of course, but any lever that we can pull that can potentially move that supply curve just a little bit to the right certainly is in the best interest of patients. This is another study. I like this one just a little bit better. I, li I like both of them, but, but this one, since I co-authored it, uh, I like this one just a little bit better. Um, so we, we, we look at the uh, work that uh, Adams and Markowitz did. We expand it, we update it with some more recent studies. And um, I'll give you the punchline. You can download this from the Upjohn Institute. It's freely available. Um, but we, we find essentially the same thing. If you let medical professionals work to the full extent of their training. There doesn't seem to be any negative effects on quality, could even enhance quality, and there doesn't seem to be any effects on cost, and if anything, potentially a reduction in cost. So let me go ahead and turn things over to my colleague, Alicia. We're playing musical chairs today. <laughs> What, what Ed didn't mention is a little bit of where my background is working in scope of practice. So not only do I coordinate much of the research being done by our center into looking at scope of practice, and when I say that, I mean the practice authority of what sort of things can these non-physicians do? Can they diagnose patients? Can they order testing? Can they refer patients? Can they operate unsupervised? Do they have to have written agreements? I also coordinate a lot of this research in between our 12 research affiliates that are external to our university and about 45 to 50 other um, research PhDs and MDs and uh, DNPs and everybody else uh, across dozens of different universities. So a lot of what I'm going to be saying in these recommendations are based upon what we found in about 218 different studies, a majority of which focus on one of three categories. So access, quality, or cost of healthcare services, and what state reforms are, are most likely to be able to move part of that supply curve. So the first one is talking about physician assistants or physician associates, depending on which group you're talking to. So like, like Ed had already said, New Hampshire does wonderful in nurse practitioners and allowing them to be able to operate in a way that they're able to work to the full extent of their training. This means that they don't necessarily have someone looking over their shoulder. They're able to diagnose their patients. They're able to come up with treatment plans. They're able to refer their patients and they're able to prescribe medications. Physician assistants, which have similar medical training, often do not have the same ability to, to be able to interact with patient care. 
But as Ed had also said, all 10 counties have some suburbs or rural areas that don't have the same um, access to, to health care of what we would expect that we would have in other areas. So while these are generally less independent than nurse practitioners, they often have some of the, our, the medical training to be able to have these frontline contact hours in primary care. In the physician shortages in the United States, which are projected to be about 135,000 physicians in primary care short uh, by 2030, which is a staggering amount, physician assistants and nurse practitioners are far more likely to actually service primary care patients, while physicians themselves are more likely to specialize into things such as cardiology or surgery or many of the other things that, that we're more used to accustomed to hearing. So physician assistants have really also brought into this next level of being able to have some sort of patient contact hours in areas where we may not be able to have the critical amount of physicians that we need available for patient care. This is really important when we might have demand surges. Like Ed said, we think mostly in supply and demand. Well, if demand goes up, we also need supply to go up. This is something that we, we learned very, very rapidly during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's something that we still try to figure out what we can do today because some of the temporary measures at that time allowed us to be able to look at the quality access and care concerns for being able to make some of these policy provisions, allowing physician assistants more autonomy over their jobs, allowed more, more healthcare professionals to move to rural and suburban areas and service patients. We've seen similar policies do very well in North Dakota and Utah, which have passed similar laws in 2019 and 2021 to expand these practices. Another reform that we think is actually a great idea is looking at pharmacists. So Idaho recently allowed pharmacists to expand their prescriptive authority to be able to have contact directly with patients. It turns out physicians are very, very good at, for example, prescribing insulin for diabetic patients, but they're not always good at remembering to prescribe the needle that you need for insulin injections. Allowing pharmacists to have some autonomy over, over their ability to prescribe things such as insulin needles or fast acting inhalers or other emergency medical treatments for necessary needs allow it so that patients don't have to go back through this medical system, go see their primary care physician again, go back and have contact hours that might take away time from physicians providing primary care, but also to have things that are not for new diagnoses, but they're, they're supplies that these patients have already had multiple times over. Allowing pharmacists to have these sorts of abilities to be able to prescribe things such as needles for diabetic patients or inhalers for people who are out of their inhaler but don't have the ability to see their primary care physician right away can help not only increase access to crucial medical services, but can increase quality and outcomes for, the, for these individuals. A second reform that we think is very crucial is the idea of physical therapists. So New Hampshire actually has a little bit of an odd law. Physical therapists can see direct access care for, for patients, but they're limited to only 25 days of direct access care. Well, if you're a patient going in and you're, and you're seeing um, your, your physical therapist, are you really wanting to see them as this direct care individual? If you know after 25 days, you're going to have to go see a physician anyways, which means you're going to have to develop a new medical relationship with, with a new practitioner. That might end up drawing some patients away from this, this really great alternative that already exists in New Hampshire because of, of a cap on the number of days that they're able to make this sort of contact. Being able to address something such as just the cap on the contact days for physical therapists is an easy policy change that can have massive effects on being able to increase access in areas that are largely underserved or may not have the ability to have full-time physicians available for the amount of patients in the area. A fourth reform we like to think about is, it turns out it's not only physicians. We also think about dentists, ophthalmologists, optometrists, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists. Dental therapists are actually a really important frontline worker when it comes to being able to maintain dental care. Having preventative dental care um, can make it so that people are much less likely to have long-term dental health issues, which might cause a variety of different things such as infections, loss of teeth, um, larger Medicare and Medicaid um, needs further on. So eight states have authorized dental therapists to go one step further, to be able to work on those cracked teeth, to be able to um, put in their own labs, to be able to take their own x-rays, and to be able to expand their scope of practice to have some things that they can operate on by themselves without needing a dentist to be present. 
They still have three years of education where they are trained on all of these specialized services, uh, such as cavities, crowns, teeth extractions. And in the eight states that have allowed dental therapists to be able to work independently with their patients, we've seen really great outcomes, such as more, more dental care available, especially in areas where you may not have full dental service available five days a week. The last one that we're going to give you is psychologist. This one's really important to me, mostly because it's something that, that I research and I've spent a lot of time looking at. In five states, um, Idaho, Illinois, Iowa, uh, New Mexico, and Louisiana, psychologists can prescribe medication. Of course, they have the great pharma, pharmacological background. They've taken multiple years of training for how to be able to properly prescribe medication, similar to their psychiatrist peers. But being able to have psychologists um, prescribing mental health medication can get mental health medication to people who are suffering from mental health disorders six to eight weeks faster. This has reduced suicide rates, um, and it has also made it so that we have more psychologists who are able to practice independently and start new practices in locations that had no mental health care before, which in New Hampshire, there are areas within all 10 counties that do not have a practicing psychiatrist that can prescribe medication for that town or city. Having psychologists prescribe medication is an alternative to being able to bring care to people who have had no care previously and, and need to be have or currently have to drive for hours or for 35 minutes to be able to get to that next care location. So with that, we just want to express that New Hampshire is doing a great job. New Hampshire's made a lot of the progress and scope of practice that, that have really made it so that you have more people who are able to access care but there's still always things that can be improved. And there's some small policy changes that we've recommended here that might be able to push that supply curve just a little bit further so that there can be more access, higher quality and lower cost for patients within New Hampshire. Okay, and with that, thank you so much. All right, thank you, Ed and Alicia. And I think in the interest of time, we definitely want to get our third speaker in. So I think we'll maybe hold questions until after our, our third speaker, um, who is remote today, uh, Maxim Pinkowski, um, who is an economic research advisor in the Equitable Growth Studies Department of the Household and Public Policy Division at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Maxim's research interests include studying the world distribution of income and understanding the dynamics of the healthcare sector in the United States. Other research interests include public economics, economic growth, and econometrics. Maxim received his PhD from MIT in 2013 and a BA from Columbia University. All right, so I'm going to welcome Maxim, and I am going to uh, switch over to the Zoom webinar and... Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much for, for inviting me to this panel and for accommodating my uh, need to be remote. Uh, thank you so much, Jason, and apologies for the initial technical difficulties. Um, I am happy today to be talking about uh, research that I started actually as my doctoral dissertation and that I subsequently published on the impact of the managed care backlash on healthcare spending. Uh, I should note this presentation reflects uh, only my opinion and not necessarily that of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or of the Federal Reserve System. Uh, any uh, errors are exclusively my own. Um, uh, a critical fact about the US healthcare sector is that it is growing as a share of the economy relentlessly. Over the last 60 years, uh, the share of GDP devoted to healthcare has nearly quadrupled from 5% in 1960 to uh, nearly 20% 20 in 2020. Uh, resources used for healthcare cannot be used for education, for childcare, for poverty reduction, for housing. Uh, so there are considerable opportunity costs associated uh, with uh, this growth of the healthcare sector and unless it becomes the entire economy, it will at some point have to stop. So uh, in this research project that I will describe to you, I will focus on a period when healthcare spending stayed roughly uh, stable uh, as a share of uh, the economy, uh, which is the 1990s. Um, 
just a second. Let me see if I can uh, put the slides into presentation mode. Um, and this period uh, coincided uh, with the managed care revolution. Insurers stopped treating health spending as uh, an act of nature and began to actively intervene in patient and physician decisions, uh, incentivizing lower utilizations for both. Uh, a major uh, practitioner of this kind of approach to health insurance was the HMO, the Health Maintenance Organization. Some of them actually employed their own doctors and um, owned their own hospitals. However, patients and physicians chafed at the restrictions of managed care, uh, especially because uh, unrealized health care spending increases are harder to see than realized decreases. And by the end of the decade, there was a cultural, media, legal, and ultimately legislative backlash against managed care. Virtually all states, including New Hampshire, though importantly not the federal government, passed uh, legislation uh, restricting or limiting managed care cost containment practices, uh, such uh, in particular, uh, they passed any willing provider laws, freedom of choice laws, basically re restricting the ability of managed care to contract with only low utilization providers. Uh, they passed legislation restricting the ability of managed care to engage in gatekeeping, utilization review, and some states even man, uh, created uh, insurer liability for managed care organizations for adverse health outcomes. And in the middle of this regulatory backlash, healthcare spending started rising as a share of uh, GDP uh, once again uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, so what I will do in this presentation is discuss uh, how in my research, I made the argument that uh, it, it was this managed care backlash rather than other things happening during the 1990s that uh, actually were responsible for this resumption in the growth of health, of health spending as a share of the economy. Uh, specifically, I uh, measure uh, the backlash by the number of regulations passed by different states to limit managed care cost containment practices, backlash regulations for short, and uh, my main finding is that the passage of these backlash regulations explains about 90% of the increase in hospital spending, not all of health spending, but hospital spending as a share of the economy in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And in particular, that a lot of this increase was concentrated in payroll spending per employee at hospitals. Uh, hospital employment did not rise, but payroll per employee did, uh, and also that uh, there were no statistically significant effects of the backlash on uh, mortality. Uh, there, were some, uh, uh, there are some estimated negative effects, but these effects cannot be distinguished from no effect at all or even from an increase in mortality just because of the noise in the data. Uh, and uh, there is an emerging literature on uh, the role of managed care in control and utilization, uh, and it reaches similar results to uh, my paper, and some of the papers listed here also find uh, very moderate effects on health. Uh, so uh, the way that uh, we go from basically the conventional story about managed care in the 90s to something like a natural experiment is by comparing within a state when it passes these backlash regulations, counties that don't have a very intensive presence of managed care with counties that do. Uh, the red line on this chart represents uh, the growth of hospital spending as a share of county personal income for counties in the bottom quartile of HMO penetration 
which is a variable that I get from some previous path-breaking research by Lawrence Baker and his co-authors. And you can see that before and after uh, the passage of backlash regulations, which are denoted by uh, this red line over here, uh, counties uh, with low HMO penetration uh, were experiencing uh, mild to moderate growth in healthcare spending, hospital spending as a share of county personal income. On the other hand, counties with a lot of HMO penetration, uh, before the backlash began, they were actually experiencing a decline in the share of county personal income accounted by hospital spending. Hospital spending was rising much slower than the county economy. However, after these regulations were passed, uh, the growth uh, in the share of hospital spending, uh, uh, sorry, the growth in the share of hospital spending as a share of the uh, county uh, economy skyrockets to way above uh, what it was for the counties in the bottom HMO penetration quartile, and it never comes back. Uh, so this, in a nutshell, is uh, the random, uh, the natural experiment uh, that my research is considering. Um, using this framework, looking at what happens to counties with different exposure to uh, managed care within a state as it passes these backlash regulations, uh, avoids a number of potential issues. For instance, what if the states passed these regulations in response to some events in the economy that also affected the share of hospital spending? Uh, it's unlikely that hospital spending in, a, in any given single county drives state decisions to pass these regulations. And we can, in fact, statistically account for all factors that affect all counties in a state in any given year, uh, as long as the effect on any county is uh, the same. And we also can control for the possibility that just counties with high HMO penetration and counties with low HMO penetration are just different. For instance, the ones with high HMO penetration are, um, uh, are more urban than the ones with low HMO penetration and that they're trending differently. Uh, this is a more sophisticated way of doing uh, the comparison, uh, as if we, for instance, just compared different states that pass different numbers of managed care backlash regulations at different times. If we were to do that latter exercise, we would get very similar results. Uh, but uh, the more uh, careful uh, difference in difference analysis within a state uh, allows us to rule out a number of alternative explanations. Um, in particular, we can rule out uh, that, for instance, other health insurance regulations which were being passed during the 1990s, like uh, mandating certain benefits or tort reform, uh, that they really were responsible for uh, the change in hospital spending as a share of the local economy, uh, or uh, that this was accounted for by changes in hospital concentration during the 90s, the number of hospitals uh, fell by a considerable amount uh, and hospital concentration increased. Uh, we can also distinguish that the backlash regulations are affecting the hospital share uh, through HMO penetration rather than because the counties involved are more urban or richer or more dense. And while this would be stretching the experimental framework a bit, we can look at different categories of backlash regulations. And the regulations that seem to increase spending the most are uh, the any willing provider laws, the freedom of choice laws, the ones that uh, affect the relationship between physicians and providers and prevent the latter from giving the former incentives to reduce utilization. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll conclude my presentation. Um, essentially, uh, I used in my research a natural experiment framework to compare counties with low and high HMO penetration before and after the passage of backlash regulations in their state. 
and found that these regulations had considerable effects on hospital spending. Uh, this presentation, I think, connects quite well uh, with the previous two, suggesting that uh, regulations of the healthcare sector can unfortunately have unintended consequences that increase spending without providing very tangible benefits to health. Uh, so uh, to conclude, it is reasonable to think about how we regulate uh, the healthcare sector, how we regulate the relationships between insurers and physicians to try to um, reduce spending to the extent that we can do so without harming patient outcomes. Thank you so much. Factors. Okay, so I'm going to repeat the question just in case it didn't go over to Zoom. And the, the question is whether um, we are able to address uh, the FDA approval of high cost drugs and devices during the 1990s, if that had an impact on healthcare spending. Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, in the analysis that I performed, I leveraged a variation mostly across, sta uh, across states and also within states. Uh, since the devices were uh, being approved by a national body, uh, most likely they would have had, uh, this approval process would have had a similar effect on uh, different states as well as on, on different counties within the same state over time. All right, thank you. Let's uh, let's move on with uh, a couple other questions in the last few minutes we have. I, I see there are seven questions online. Maybe we should take, uh, see if one of these um, is particularly interesting. Um, okay, here's here's one that I, I know you, you do talk about a little bit in, in your study, Jared. There's a question here. How are DPCs regulated to prevent them from cherry picking only healthy patients? The DPC model seems like a type of unregulated insurance in that it encourages more patients with fewer visits and incentivizes them to keep complex patients out to increase income. The actual health insurance industry is highly regulated. Insurers cannot market specifically to healthy people, and they cannot drop coverage to complex or very ill patients. How are DPCs regulated in a way that prevents this type and other types of discrimination against patients? And let me give you a... Thanks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> right now, there isn't... I don't think there is any regulation for that particular uh, aim. Um, I mean, they have other kinds of regulations, things about uh, di what they can dispense and how much they can dispense, uh, you know, um, um, uh, drugs and, and um, you know, how much they can do for um, how much they can uh, advertise and things like that. But um, no, I don't think there is actually anything along those lines for, for that particular, um, for that particular aim. It, I, I don't think there's by the same token, I don't think there's any evidence that there's much of a problem yet. I mean, maybe it's one of those things where it's there. It's it's still a small, um, it's a small industry, small it's small practice type, and so it hasn't risen maybe maybe to the uh, to, to the level where there's a, a major concern about that. There's um, you do find DPC practices in a variety of different places. You find them in uh, rural places, in urban places, in between, in the suburbs. You, you find them in lots of different states. I think all, I think there's 49 states that have them. I want to say, you know, South Dakota might be the only state that doesn't have a DPC practice right now. Um, there's, uh, for, for the, with the, um, the, that kind of adverse selection, um, I don't think there is anything um, that is, is currently, you know, aimed at that. Um, so, yeah. if I may, Jared, uh, it seems to me that one of the reasons why insurance companies—and tell me if I'm wrong here, not being the expert in the field—but insurance companies might want to cherry pick because they're required to charge everyone the same. But it seems as if your research was showing that DPC practices do charge elderly patients more than younger patients, and maybe that's a, a reason why they would not want to cherry pick, or or maybe. Uh, maybe that's not enough. I don't know. Right. No, no. I mean, that. I think that could get to it. Um, I mean, and they also, I mean, it's, it's like they're, um, 
they're 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 welcoming of uh, of the most most DPCs don't have a limit on how many um, visits you can. It, it's in effect unlimited visits. Um, they don't say that you can only come into the to the uh, to the office, you know, uh, twice a year or something like that. So they're they're actually kind of designed to be um, a high touch kind of thing. So if you're a, a patient that wants to see your doctor every month. I mean, the DPCs, a lot, a lot of them are, are, are built for that. I mean, so it, it so this particular kind of concern, um, you know, some, you know, could, would, is it, is it ex excluding the, the, the more, the more complex patients, the, the patients that want a lot of visits? Um, it, they, they don't seem to be, uh, if anything, they seem to be uh, kind of embracing of, of that kind of, 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 of that kind of patient, of, of that kind of uh, the market. So I think they're catering to it. Okay, let's. Uh, we have time for I think two more questions. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I switched to DPC um, about three or four months ago, and I would say it's almost the opposite of that question because I could I could be texting my doctor right now and get a response. You know what I mean? It's it's just we're we're with my traditional doctor. I had no contact with them except while I was there in the office. And to go to the office cost me fifteen dollars, so that's discouraging me to do that, right? So, but my question for you is: Is there enough doctors to be to have a lot of DPC? Because my understanding is the federal government controls the number of doctors in the country because they pay for residency and they limit that. And so my DPC doctor has this six hundred patient or whatever. But my original doctor, I understand their lists are, are maybe 2,000 patients, something like that, right? So they're just, it seems to me there just can't be enough doctors to do this. Is that right? It's a great question. And I think, uh, I, I think what the, the best way to look at that, though, is not the, uh, the comparison of, oh, if somebody is going from a, a, you know, one style of medical practice where they have a, a panel of 2000 patients uh, that, that they're seeing, and then they, then they kind of down, you know, uh, downscale, let's say, to, uh, to DPC, and then now they're only seeing 400 or 600 you know, haven't you know, the the temptation it might be to look at that and say, well, you know, we raise the questions you just raised is that aren't, aren't they aren't, aren't we you know we're going to be short doctors now because you know they're, they're each doctor is seeing fewer patients. I think the right comparison is uh, so many people go into DPC because they're they're sick of practicing, and the alternative might be uh, leaving medicine altogether. Um, so the, the right comparison isn't necessarily, I think, you know, again, this is something that, you know, it's, I'd love some great study to come out on this, but um, so many of those doctors are, are, are going into DPC because they're kind of, you know, frustrated with the system, et cetera. Their next move might've been to retire or to, you know, go into industry or you know, do research or something like that. They, they might've, they might've left altogether, in which case the right comparison is zero. Uh, Cause that's the numbers of, of physicians, of patients that they would have seen. Um, so I, I think that's an interesting question, and I, I think it cuts uh, the way that I'm <laughs> leaning towards there. All right, we have time for one more question. Hopefully, our, maybe our in-person presenters can stick around for a little while, especially to talk to legislators if, if they have additional questions. Um, just had a quick question on one of the points very early on in the first presentation. Uh, it noted that New Hampshire had low facility capacity and I wanted to know if that was adjusted for population and also age of population, um, because we don't have a lot of people in New Hampshire. So if we don't have a lot of facilities, it might be more or less uh, the the market meeting demand. Right. No, I think all those stats are um, per per population. But uh, hey, we've we've got the report, so we can uh, we can we can chat about that and, and and look at those those citations. Those were those were measurements that I made. Um, but those are those are um, uh, stats from the from the literature. Um, I'm pretty sure they are, but we can we can look at them in depth if uh, if you'd like. Well, and, and New Hampshire being the second oldest state, you would think would require more capacity, perhaps. Yeah, than other states. Yeah. I don't know. Still yeah. out there. All right. Well, that, that brings our public program to a close. Thank you very much to our in-person audience and to our online audience and to all of our presenters.